my feelings about mountain biking have changed over the years. You know, I used to race mountain bikes. I used to race cross country and downhill. So, you know, I think I was a speed demon and also liked the technical challenge, but, and I still do, but and anymore, I'm more into the exploration aspects of it um, and enjoying it as a mode of travel to explore more. Episode 310, The Adventures of Mountain Biking with Brittany and Frank Kinsella. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hey friends, Kurt here. Before we start the main part of today's show, which is going to be really cool on mountain biking with Frank and Brittany Kinsella, I wanted to uh, talk just a little bit of business, real real briefly. The main way that the Adventure Sports Podcast uh, earns its keep, so to speak, is through advertising. And the main way that advertising revenue increases is if there are more of you listeners out there listening. It's a very simple formula. So we would love to see the show continue to grow, but not just because of the advertising. It's because we really believe that the message that we're putting out there is good for people. It's good for people to live healthier lives, to uh, have enlarged lives, and to gain that internal perspective of meeting and overcoming challenges and learning from other people who have done the same We hope that that message is inspirational to you, and we hope that you believe that it's a message worth sharing with others for better quality of life. And so there are ways that you can do that that would really, really help us. Of course, the first is simple. Just tell your friends about us. Can you think of a friend that enjoys adventure sports or would benefit from adventure sports? Tell them about the Adventure Sports Podcast. That helps a ton. Number one, best thing that you can do. Second thing you can do is to subscribe to the show. And the reason is because when you subscribe, you get that reminder. Oh, yeah, that's that Adventure Sports Podcast show. Man, I haven't heard that in a, in a week or so. I better go back and, and catch up on those episodes. So please do subscribe to the Adventure Sports Podcast on Stitcher or iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts because that really does make a difference. It also helps if you join our new Facebook group. If you join the new Facebook group for the Adventure Sports Podcast, then you get to interact with some of our past guests, other listeners. You can talk adventure sports and share what you're doing, get perspective and maybe some advice about upcoming trips and adventures that you have on your calendar. And so I really encourage you to do that because as that Facebook grows, Um, It adds a lot of benefit to what we're doing here and builds the community even more. We really appreciate that. Of course, we have several things you can do that we hope will be a benefit to you, like joining our membership site where you get discounts on adventure-related equipment and experiences. And if you have a business and you want to get the word out to one of the best, most highly focused communities on outdoor adventure, then please contact us and we'll help you get the word out. That's all. Thank you very much for listening today, and now on with the show. Thank you again for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast today. I have returning guests Frank and Brittany Kinsella on the phone. And Frank and Brittany have been on twice before, and they're going to be on again in the future. They have so much going on, but let me give you just a little bit of context. So Frank and Brittany both live in Crested Butte, Colorado. And they are really active in the outdoors. Their first big claim to fame that we discussed was that they have climbed and skied all of the Colorado 14ers. And it's a very short list of people that have managed to accomplish that feat. And both Frank and Brittany have done that. And then we also had them on a while back to talk about an initiative they're working on to save the slate, is what they call it. It's access issues with coming up with winter plans for access with the Forest Service, and they're active trying to make sure that winter access to the areas around Colorado remain available. And uh, you can hear that show if you go to adventuresportspodcast.com. You can look up the old shows with Frank and Brittany. If you want to know more about public land use and access issues, that's really a, a very informative and educational episode. But today we are here to talk about mountain biking. 
The season is changing. Winter is going to be here very, very soon. I've already been snowed on twice so far this fall, Frank and Brittany. Um, but there's still plenty of good mountain biking. I wanted to get one more mountain biking episode in before we have to talk nothing but snow. So welcome to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having us again. <laughs> you bet. It's always my pleasure. And I should say, we're not going to go on about it, but you have a book coming out soon about backcountry skiing. And we're going to talk about that in a future episode, but I'm really excited to hear all about that. You guys are just tearing it up. I mean, a mountain biking, 14er skiing, the backcountry skiing guide. Um, you're active to protect access to public lands. I, uh, I just, I don't know of that many people that are that plugged in to adventure sports. Thanks, we try. <laughs> it's maybe a little too, it's maybe a little overwhelming sometimes, but and, yeah. And somehow we have jobs that don't involve any of that either, really. So, um, yeah, anyway. I know, that's funny. So Frank is a realtor, and I have to tell everyone, when we moved to Gunnison, Frank was our realtor to help us find the house that we purchased. And Frank, you did a, just a, a great job with that. Very professional, uh, very good realtor services. So thank you for that. And want to let everyone know, if you are interested in real estate in the Gunnison Crested Butte area, call up Frank. Definitely. He's, he knows his stuff. So, Brittany, you've done some teaching, some tutoring, and some other work on the side. Yep. It's, it's part of living in the mountains, isn't it? You have to wear a lot of hats. Yeah. Yes, you find, the, you find a niche where you need to work, and you make it work. <laughs> That's really cool. And in your first episode on Skiing All the 14ers, we actually talked quite a lot about how to manage that kind of living in a resort type area in the Colorado Rockies. It's, it's not the average lifestyle that most Americans experience. And it's not just because you're in a resort location. It's because of the interesting micro economies that surround these resorts. It really changes a lot about how you have to live life to be there. Exactly. Definitely. And, and this, especially, I think, in Crest Butte, which is smaller than, say, Bale or, or Summit County. Or, or Ashton. Or some, of, some of the other larger... Um, larger places but uh yeah you can make it work if you want to well and it's really cool I, I we talked a lot in the first um interview with you guys about that and i think that the listeners may be interested in that again but i don't want to spend a lot of time on it today because i want to get to what is so unique about the mountain biking and what the two of you have been up to this summer frank i'll just hand it to you i want you to tell us about the trail quest program how it got started and what that's all about okay well i'll, I'll do my best. Um, I guess I'll go into a fair bit of context and, and basically it all, and there are other people that would probably be better to talk about this with, um, at the tourism association, but, but it came out of conversations about, you know, recreation in Gunnison and Crested Butte, um, and elsewhere. And there are just certain places where everybody kind of tends to go to, uh, here in Colorado, you hear a lot about it, uh, at Hanging Lake, for instance. Um, right. and they might, you know, it's it's a real mess there, and then Conundrum Hot Springs too, where they might start doing some permitting, and uh, and here in Crested Butte, there are just you know we have all these trails and all these roads and all these places to explore, and yet certain places uh, like 401 uh, and a few other trails get you know the lion's share of the traffic. Um, you know, people have probably heard of the 80-20 rule in business and things, where 20% of the people do 80% of the work or whatever, and it's kind of like that 20% of the trails get 80% of the traffic at least. And so, um, you know, they came up with this app that's, that's a free download in the Gunnison and Crested Butte area. And it lets you, you know, track your rides and look at maps and, and see what trails are where and which ones go into wilderness. And you can, you can track those rides and submit them. And then there's a, a leaderboard and the, the, you know, the game such as it is, is, is to ride all the, all the legal, uh, single track, all the non-wilderness single track in the Gunnison and Crest Butte area. Um, and they claim over 100, 750 miles total of, of single track. So say that number again. I, I think that every time I hear that number, I think, could that be right? Right. Yeah. 750 miles. It's, uh, it's an awful lot of, of different and unique single track that we have here. And, and so that's what we've been riding. And wow. it's this was all generated by the uh, Gunnison Crested Butte Tourism Association. So that's who came up with this plan and this challenge and the app as well. Well, it's really fun. So it's a cell phone app. It tracks where you are 
And as you record your, your ride, uh, if it's not single track, it doesn't count. If you do the same trail twice, it doesn't count. It has to be unique miles on single track. And that's a lot tougher to do than I originally thought. When we moved to Gunnison, I, I turned on the app and I started recording. And I thought, oh, yeah, man, I'm going to get 100 miles in in a week. I maybe have ridden a couple hundred miles. But on my app, I'm up to like 30-something. Because I keep doing the same trails over again. <laughs> that's that's what you can't do. Yeah, you gotta you gotta plan your rides and and always ride something new, basically to uh, to keep moving up. Yeah, and we've kind of calculated it out that around two hundred or two hundred and fifty miles uh, within that is about kind of the standard rides for our area, and beyond that mileage, you're kind of exploring where people don't normally ride. To bravely go where no one has gone before. <laughs> oh, I'm sure people have gone there before, but it's not normal, you know. It's not you don't see b- bikers on it every day. So, well, this is I I have to hear what's going on with the two of you because one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this with you is you are in the first and second position in the competition for riding all of these 750 miles of trails. <laughs> and Frank, you were ahead for a good part of the summer, then Brittany passed you. And it looks to me like she's staying ahead pretty solid. So I got to understand this. You guys are married, and I thought maybe you were biking together, but I get a suspicion now you guys are competing head to head. Well, I don't know if we're competing, but yeah, we do have our own schedule. So there are times when I get to ride and she doesn't get to go with me and, and vice versa. So he was pretty disappointed when I passed. <laughs> I thought maybe there was a friendly matrimonial competition going on. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> He's been trying to get past me again all summer, but I keep giving him a good a good challenge. <laughs> well, I can't imagine what your summer has been like to get in the miles because I know I've been riding a lot, and I'm not getting anywhere compared to the two of you. So uh, the amount of time required, I mean, let's talk about the, the numbers real fast. Do you know what your mileage is? I know that TrailQuest thinks I've ridden 440 unique miles total miles is a lot more than that i'm i don't know i'm probably up into the 13 1400 miles range but that would include dirt roads as well right and um i'm at like 420 i think is about where i'm at 20 miles behind 20 miles one ride one good ride frank that's all it would take it would, it would, but uh, I was just looking this morning, and it looks like Monarch Pass got a few inches of snow, and that's where all my, uh, that's where some of my my longer miles that Brittany's already done would come in. So I might be, <laughs> uh, I might not be winning this one. Oh boy! Well, I drove over Monarch Pass last night, and it was very snowy. Now it might dry off before the the snow that sticks for the season comes, but yeah, you could be in trouble there. Yeah, yeah. Oh well. <laughs> it's, it's gonna start up again obviously next summer they weren't expecting someone to do it all in one summer uh and even people who are you know just starting and people can actually load up gps tracks too so it's not like you had to be doing it all all this summer right well it's just kind of a fun thing anytime there's some sort of a competition that helps people to be motivated to get out there and do something i think that that's really fun and there are a lot of people that are on Trail Quest that are doing this. So I think it's effective. You guys have a ton of people that are, are participating in the program. Um, there are some people that aren't that far behind you as well. I mean, the, if you look at the top 20 riders, people are putting in some crazy mileage this summer. Yeah, it's been really fun to watch. Absolutely. And uh, like you said, I think it's it's doing its job. We've uh, For me, having lived here longer than Brittany, I've been going back to things I haven't been to and. 15 or even 20 years, uh, which has been really fun to revisit those areas. And as an example, we, we did a seven hour ride on the 4th of July weekend and we were out for seven, you know, all day and saw exactly zero people because mm-hmm. we were on, we were on a, a weird trail. Um, and if we had been, been on one of the standard ones, I'm sure we would have seen a hundred people. So it was kind of nice to, it, it worked from that aspect for sure. So question, you just use the word weird trail, and I'm curious, as you guys have uh, gone to the less and less used trails to get your mileage in, have you found some some uh, 
some real hidden gems in there? Or is there a reason why the trails are less used? It depends on the trail. I'd say yes or, and no in both. Um, one of the ones that we just found recently that we would definitely go back and probably do every year is the western edge of, of the Fossil Ridge. Um, it hugs the wilderness boundary, but it is legal for motorized and mechanized travel, such as mountain bikes. Um, and it's, it's a really fun trail. So that one we would definitely go back to. Some of them, you know, I don't think there's any, been anything like, you know, may, there's maybe one trail I wouldn't really go back to that much, but most of them I'd probably go back to, but just not every year, maybe every like five years. Cause most of them are good for some reason, you know, um, whether it's, you know, it gets you up in the Alpine, you get scenic views or, or, you know, just things like that. Um, they're all special in their own way. Um, it just might not always be the best riding. I think a lot of the reason why some of these aren't popular too, they're just, they're just hard. Um, you know, they're, they're not a two to three hour ride. They're an all day ride. And and that, that cuts down substantially on the number of people who are, you know, strong enough and willing enough to, to do that all day. Um, and lots of hike a bike, lots of hike a bike. We've taken our bikes for some nice walks. It's like we have (laughs) two dogs. Lots of hike a bike. Well, I've talked to a lot of people that have done some really tough trails where you have to push the bike for a majority of it. And they say, no, it's still worth it because the downhills come and it's just so much fun. So was that your experience too? Sometimes, sometimes you hike your bike up and then you're like, oh, it's going to be some sweet downhill somewhere. And then you're like, wait, where's the downhill? (laughs) (laughs) Why did I hike my bike up? But yeah, I mean, I agree. You know, it's, it's usually worth hiking your bike up if there is a good downhill, but sometimes the way the trail works, sometimes there isn't. Brittany, will you tell us, since you've done so many miles in first place, wow, it's amazing. Will you tell us the variety of trails that are out there? the different types of scenery, different types of terrain, altitude. I mean, there's everything. So uh, what have you experienced? The trails that we've been on that are lesser used by bikers tend to be often motorized trails. And so they get a little bit more beat up with um, dirt bikers. Um, So you just see a little bit more erosion, which can make it more fun if you're a good rider, but it also makes it harder. So they, um, you know, they have a lot more rocks in them. They're not the smooth, necessarily buff trails. Um, A lot of these trails can tend to have some serious elevation gain. A lot of our rides are somewhere over 4,000 vert. Um, And, you know, some of them go straight up and then straight down, or some of them go, you know, kind of cross country style, a little bit up, a little bit down. Um, A lot of our favorite ones are in some great pine forests. um, And then others are in the high alpine above tree line, which are wonderful as well. And then lately, we've been trying to get on trails that take us through the aspens so that we can um, enjoy the fall colors. Oh, yeah, which are delightful right now. Oh, yeah, gorgeous. Probably for about another week or so, and then they're going to blow away. Exactly. Well, you just rattled off real quickly there. There's so much difference. You mentioned riding above tree line, so we're talking about 12,000, maybe 11,500 and up. That is pretty high altitude for mountain biking. What is that like? Well, we're very accustomed people in the Alpine from skiing to biking. We we enjoy alpine riding as much as we enjoy alpine skiing so um you know the i would say already living at 9500 feet that elevation doesn't have a huge impact on us a lot of times um so we're not really impacted by that but we just love the beauty and the scenery up above treeline whether it's winter summer spring whatever fall we just love it Well, I would recommend for people who are just getting into mountain biking, unless you sleep at 9,500 feet, going up above tree line is going to be tough. (laughs) That's going to be tough. It's it's pretty tough for sure. There's definitely some easier trails. Like 401 isn't too bad and it does get you above tree line. It's one of the easier rides where where people can enjoy the, some of the Alpine views and everything. Um, And it's not that hard of a trail, but the goal of trail quest is to get people to try other trails that 
aren't so popular like 401. But, you know, the, one of the cool things about the Gunnison Crest Butte area is, you know, we have all this alpine riding, but at the same time, we have some really good desert riding at Hartman Rocks and things like that. You can get some riding that's almost just the same as Fruta, and it's wonderful as well. So we have such a variety of riding in this area. It's amazing. Well, and that's one of the reasons why I've not experienced as much variety yet. We're within riding, easy riding distance of Hartman Rocks. And so I find myself riding there so much. And I haven't done all the trails there. People keep coming over and saying, hey, take me on a ride on one of your favorite trails. Well, that means I'm doing a repeat, you know. And uh, right. so I've ridden the same trails three, four, five times that I just love. But I'm excited because there's so many out there I've not even tried yet. And so my experience so far albeit it's only been about six weeks, but my experience so far has primarily been that high desert, you know, Hartman Rocks experience. So I've yet to get up to Crest of Butte and experience the trails up there. Yeah, which you'll just have a whole other thing to look forward to, too. And hopefully we've got a little bit more time here before everything snowed in. But uh... the snowstorm last night, I think, shut off the alpine riding for the season. Yeah, it may have. It may have. Mm-hmm. Fall is the best time to start thinking snow, and Bent Gate Mountaineering is ready to help you get prepared for your epic winter. Come check out the latest in alpine touring, telemark, NTN, and splitboarding gear. Brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear from beacons to airbags, and they are ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. You can also rent skis, boots, split boards, beacons, shovels, and probes at Bentgate. What's more, they host free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Stop by Bentgate in Golden, Colorado, or go to bentgate.com to check out your new gear as well as to get updates on all of their events. The 180 Flame is the ideal alternative to bulky and fragile gas-burning camp stoves. The 180 Flame utilizes fewer parts with minimal weight and maximized reliability. The locking tab and slot design means there are no hinges, welds, or rivets to fail you in the field. Cook your food and boil water quickly using only small amounts of natural fuels including twigs, grass, pine cones, and leaves. Weighing just 6.4 ounces, the 180 Flame is the ideal alternative to a backpacking stove. You can find your new flame at 180tac.com or a retailer near you. 180 Flame. Think big, pack small. Well, let's let's rewind a little bit now that people kind of have a context for why we're talking about mountain biking with the two of you. I would like to talk about mountain biking in general. Um, there are a lot of mountain bikers out there who love the sport, and there are others who are like, "What's the big deal? That looks really hard. You're actually riding a bicycle on what should be a hiking trail, and you're going up on mountains. And why would anybody do that?" Well, you know, with biking, you can get to places a little bit faster than hiking usually. Um, So there is, especially on flatter terrain or on downhills. Um, The other thing is, is I don't actually like to to walk downhill. (laughs) I've Mm. never really liked it. And it's always been a little hard on my knees. So one of the reasons why I started skiing all of Colorado's 14ers was because I wanted to climb up them, but I didn't want to walk down them. So biking kind of works the same way. You know, I, you work hard to get up, but then you get a cool descent on the way down. That doesn't necessarily beat up your body like hiking would. And I want to point out, Brittany, I think the last time you were on, we mentioned that you had just had knee surgery. You are in recovery, so to speak, and you've put all these miles in on your mountain bike. How's that going? And the knee feels better than it's felt in 10 years. So the two surgeries and the year long recovery has been worth it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it feels stronger than ever and, uh, biking is great recovery. So, and you know, my physical therapist said that I should get some hiking in too. And I figure I've 
definitely hiked my bike enough that it counts. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Well, I wanted to point that out yeah. because it's a different mode of travel, and it might work better with what people have going on in their body, right? For sure. sure. Well, I'm glad that it's working out for you, and it makes me wonder now if, if your knee is just going to be that much better for ski season because of all the mountain biking that you've done. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm doing other things, too. I've been in the in the gym and, and working on some strengthening and isolating the muscles in that knee, which also helps, but the biking is certainly helping a ton as well. Oh, that's cool. Frank, what about you? Why would you recommend mountain biking to people as a sport? I mean, it's, it's what Brittany said, but then, you know, to kind of go off this whole trail quest thing is it it's a great tool for exploring uh much like skis you can cover a lot more ground than you can um on foot so you know the great thing about mountain biking is you can do a a 20 or 30 mile ride and go from one valley to another valley to a third valley and still get home in time for dinner and that that you know if you're going to do that on foot you're going to need to be a trail runner and and uh and even then that's going to be pretty difficult so uh, biking's always been just another tool to explore for me and, and just find different areas. Well, it's been so much fun for me. I'm going to give just a little backstory about my mountain biking. I used to mountain bike years and years ago, just a little when the sport was just kind of taken off, but I had a severe back injury and I was actually paralyzed in one leg. A lot of our listeners may know that uh, about 80% paralyzed. And, um, uh, I was just excited that I could walk with a cane again, you know? And so after a couple of years of recovering from that, I started mountain biking again, and it was tough. So I got to experience what it's like to try to get fit enough to mountain bike after not, you know, after losing that fitness. My first summer of serious mountain biking, I only got a, a couple of rides in a week. And I'll, I'll tell you, they, they were strenuous. It was difficult for me. It was tough. I was usually biking at, oh, around 9,000 feet and on some fairly steep stuff. But still, it was, it was hard, and I thought, this is so healthy, it feels good because it hurts so good. Mm-hmm. But then the next summer, as I continued down that path, the next summer of mountain biking, the, the pain really subsided, and it turned into a lot more fun. And it was just a lot less of the hurt so good and a lot more of the, wow, this is a really cool sport. I bring that up because I know that there's so many people out there who, who maybe they've been on the couch a little bit too much, and mountain biking sounds like it would be a pretty tough sport to, to take on. But one beautiful thing about biking, just like Brittany mentioned, so many people can bike without injuries because it's a smoother motion than running or hiking or, or things like that. It, it can be very therapeutic and a fantastic way to get back in shape. And now when I go mountain biking, I feel strong, and it's all about the sport. And I am having so much fun. My favorite things, and I'm going to ask each of you this question, my favorite things are trying to get up an obstacle that's very challenging, and then, of course, those fun, curvy, swervy downhills. Just a blast. So, Frank, what is your favorite aspect of mountain biking? I'd be right there with you. There's there's the two two camps. There's the, the flow trails, as everybody calls them, and... You've got a lot of that at Hartman's. You've got a lot of that up here at Crest Butte Mountain Resort on the at the ski area, and some of the natural, you know, older trails that are those are those are pretty good for that too. And so, yeah, those are really fun when you're just in a great, you know, flow back and forth, swerving through. And uh, but the other part too is is like you said, it's the, the technical challenge, and you come up on something and you're not totally sure if you're going to clear it, and then you do, and you and uh, yeah, those. I, they're kind of even for me because they're they're so different, actually. So I, I, they're both good in their own way. Brittany, what do you think? Mountain biking, my feelings about mountain biking have changed over the years. You know, I used to race mountain bikes. I used to race cross country and downhill. So, you know, I think I was a speed demon and also liked the technical challenge. But And I still do. But and anymore, I'm more into the exploration aspects of it. Um, and enjoying it as a mode of travel to explore more. Mm, Which is also very fun. I love being outside, moving at that pace. Like you mentioned earlier, you can cover a lot of ground on a bike, but it's not like you're in a car. So it's almost the perfect balance where you're out there interacting with nature, but you're able to cover enough ground to see a lot of scenery change. Exactly. You know, and we are the 
I'm the type of writer now where I'll stop and I'll take those pictures because I'm enjoying enjoying the scenery um, and things like that. I won't ride so fast that I that I forget to look around and enjoy it. Well, and we've had a lot of bike packers on the show who do bike packing races, but some people bike pack just for the joy of traveling on a bike. And, you know, they're doing tens of thousands of miles. And I think it's it's just a delightful way to travel. It really is. It is. So I would like to uh, point people to your website. And the website is 14erskiers.com, and that's 14erskiers.com. And, of course, they have the blogs there that talk about skiing the Colorado 14ers. So if you're looking for information on how to do that, it's there. But the reason I want to talk about it is because all the stuff you've put on there about mountain biking as well. You've developed an amazing mountain biking guide on that site. Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was mostly my doing. When I first moved to Crested Butte, I just started keeping track of everything I was doing uh, in terms of mileage and, uh, and ride time. And it was mostly just for for myself. So I would know if I had to, if I had a work shift at three o'clock and I had three hours, what can I ride? You know, instead of just saying, I think that takes three hours. And the next thing I know I'm an hour late for work. So I just started writing that all down on a, on a piece of paper in the late nineties. And when we started our, our website, I was like, I should, I should put this all, all up there. And, um, honestly, all these trails we've been doing this summer, I, I probably have 15 different routes I need to add. Um, that'll be a project for this winter, I think, to to update that. And and so that'll add up to like 150 different routes with, with the mileage and the, and the total ride time and a description um, for people to check out if they're looking for something new in the Crest Butte area. And something that I've been working on, um, you know, part of my recovery, I couldn't ride really hard single track when I started out. I mean, my doctor basically said, you can't fall. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) so I was riding some really pretty easy single track miles and exploring that, um, you know, trying to find that out, searching for easy, but fun single track. And I was looking all over the state for that. And I've been kind of publishing articles under like, they all start with mountain biking 101. Um, and they highlight different beginner trails that, you know, some of them are long, some of them are a little shorter. A lot of them you could just do as an out and back, you know, and make it as long as you wanted, um, or as short as you wanted, but you know, it's really geared towards beginner riders or family rides. Um, so people who are just getting into mountain biking or wanting to mountain bike with the family should check that out. That's and awesome. Those, those are, those are all over the place, by the way. She didn't, I mean, they're, they're in, um, Dolores and Cortez and Montrose and Salida and Buena Vista. And, um, they're not all just here in our local area by any means. Yep. That's cool. It's an amazing resource. So if you're looking for some new rides or you're, you're thinking, Hey, I'm going to take a trip uh, to Colorado. You can find some of those rides that Brittany's talking about or to the Gunnison Crested Butte Valley. Then boy, there's a, just a ton of documentation on there, Frank. Thanks for all the work you did to that, but it gives people ideas about options for rides that they may not think of. Maybe word of mouth isn't talking about these enough, you know, and that's part of what the Trail Quest competition is all about. Exactly. Well, it's a really, really good resource. So if people go to 14erskiers.com, how do they find the mountain biking? That's a tab right in the middle. I believe it says resources. Is that right, Brittany? Yeah, it says resources from the menu in the top. And then you drop down and it says mountain bike, mountain biking guide or guides and then mountain biking guide. Well, the reason I ask that is because the, the URL is 14 or skiers. So people know what they're coming for. And then they go to the page and you don't see mountain biking, you see resources. <laughs> so it's all right. there if you dig a little bit, right? Exactly. Yep. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Or obviously a Google search of 14 or skiers, mountain biking guide or something like that would, would probably take you straight to the page too. If, Definitely. Well, I would like to uh, get your perspective on the different styles and types of mountain biking. It was in the 80s, I think, when I saw my first mountain bike. And I was a road biker. So when I saw a mountain bike, I kind of chuckled. I just thought, no way. <laughs> it looks heavy and clunky. And why would anyone get on that? And now it's, it's probably my favorite sport. But there are so many different types of mountain biking that have developed since the beginning. 
people are doing so many different um, styles of mountain biking. So let's see if we can list a few and then kind of give a, a few bullet points on what makes that unique in mountain biking. You guys game for that? Okay. Cross country. Brittany, you already mentioned cross country racing. So why, why is something cross country versus another style? I think cross country is more geared towards going across instead of straight up and down. Although a lot of cross country races actually do go up and down, but you know, it's, it's a little bit lighter bikes that are geared towards traveling farther. Don't necessarily have as much suspension So they might not be as enjoyable on some technical rides or technical descents. So the bikes are a little bit sportier, a little bit faster, a little bit lighter, uh, aggressive frame geometry, which means that they're not as good on the downhills, but they're fast. Did I get that right? Yeah. I mean, they, you know, it's geared to go faster, um, especially just up. (laughs) Okay, and so I ride a cross-country bike right now, and that's why I know a little bit about it. And when I'm on a technical downhill, I really have to watch my technique. I have to ride the bike for the conditions, or I'll end up over the handlebars. But on a downhill bike, you get a a lot more of a forgiving downhill ride. So, Brittany, you used to do downhill racing. What's a downhill bike like? Downhill bikes are typically pretty heavy, um, and they have a lot of travel. I mean, these days, they it's so much travel, like seven, eight inches, I think, you know, it can be a lot. And, um, but mainly they're just geared towards people going hard over really technical terrain and hopefully building burlier bikes that will break less for people that are in that kind of terrain all the time and banging them around and probably crashing into things. Um, um, when I was first downhill racing, they, the bikes weren't at quite as burly as they are now. And I think, Every time I went out, I broke something on my bike or something on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had to quit because it was just becoming too expensive, too much to fix. But um, they've gotten better at building those bikes now. And I should mention the downhill bikes are really a dog when you're trying to climb. They're just not made for it. Right. They're mostly, you know, hopefully, ideally, they're going to be going up on a lift at a ski area or um, perhaps getting shuttled on on some of the shuttle rides. But uh, their ideal location is at a ski area with, with the trails that are purposely built built for those bikes. And I've done very little downhill on a downhill bike, but the little bit that I've done, I was amazed at what the bike would easily roll over. You can just, you, you shouldn't be a sloppy rider, but it's so forgiving, you know, compared to the cross country bike. You can go down stuff. It's just mind blowing that a, a bicycle can roll that when you wouldn't even think about walking it. You you couldn't walk it, but the bike does just fine. Yeah, exactly. You, you can pick a bad line with a with a downhill bike most of the time. Yeah, a lot of times <laughs> if you just point it straight and don't really put on the front brake a whole lot, like you're probably fine. <laughs> well, now let's get a little bit in between. I guess if we really wanted to do the extremes, we'd have to talk about cyclocross as well. And I'll just mention cyclocross is like the crossover between road biking and mountain biking, where you're doing some dirt and some pavement, and you're on almost a road bike with mountain biking tires, right? Exactly. That would probably be the fastest of the, let's call it the the mountain biking family. Yeah. And then would come the cross country. We've gone to the other extreme, which is the downhill but what's in the middle here? There's still at least two or three more categories. I think the main one people are, are calling them trail bikes these days, and that's what both of us are riding on, which is like a five or six inch bike. Uh, a lot of those are going to be, you know, 28 ish pounds, give or take. Um, and they're kind of, you know, the angles and the geometry are a little bit more similar to a downhill bike, and yet they're light enough that they can go everywhere that you would ever want to go with a, with a cross country bike, but they're a whole lot more fun on the downhills. And those bikes, they, uh, they do climb well. A lot of them have features that will lock out the back shock, so you get a firmer uh, back end on the bike for climbing, which is nice. So you can still enjoy climbing on, on that bike, or as with a downhill bike, it could be tough. Um, but they're also very forgiving on the downhill. And I keep on going back and forth, should that be my next bike? Because when I'm on a technical downhill on my cross-country bike, I have a ton of fun, but I think, oh, it'd be so much more fun if I had a trail bike. 
But then when I'm going up, I'm like, no, I'm on the right bike. <laughs> <laughs> I think that most people find that what you give up on the up with a trail bike versus a cross country bike is well worth it, especially if you're not a competitive racer. And what you gain on the downhills more than makes up for what you lose on the uphill. I think that's why the trail bike category has become, I think, the most popular by, by quite a bit. And I'm going to speak beyond my knowledge here. And for our listeners out there, forgive me if this is your niche in mountain biking. Maybe you could write in to us and fill us in or, or come on the show and describe it to us. But enduro bikes, that we're getting pretty subtle now, I think, in the different styles of bikes. But an enduro race is where you're timed on the downhills, you're racing the downhills, and then you have a time limit for the uphills, but you're not racing uphill. And so they're making bikes that are specific to enduro racing. Do you guys know much about the, the differences of those bikes? I think what, what I was talking about earlier, the trail bikes, for the most part, are what's being used in these enduro races. Um, they might be, a, like you said, it's a really subtle difference. Like a trail bike might be the five inch version and the enduro bike is maybe the six and it maybe is a half pound heavier, but they're almost identical. I mean, I, I have a, a five inch bike, Brittany has a six inch bike. So I guess technically maybe we could, but they're, they're, they're blended pretty well. I think That's they're very similar. I mean, mine is often used in enduro races. I have a Juliana Rubion, which is equivalent to the Santa Cruz Bronson. It's just the female version of it. And those are probably two of the most popular bikes being used in the enduro races. I've seen um, cross country races with people on downhill bikes. Well, maybe not downhill bikes, but definitely on, on trail bikes and enduro bikes, right? So, and then sure. you see people doing downhilling on a cross country bike. So, all of this is kind of subtle, but when you ride the different bikes, you can definitely tell the difference. And it, I just wanted to do that to kind of help the audience, if they're not familiar with mountain biking, to realize it's actually a pretty broad sport. And we haven't even talked about the fat bikes, the snow bikes yet. Right. No, yeah. I think the key is with bikes is, you know, every bike has a slightly different geometry. And it's really important to kind of demo a bike and see what kind of style of bike you really enjoy before you actually purchase one because they're they're really even even if from one enduro bike to the next some of them can feel so different um and it's just really important to kind of check it out before you actually purchase one because they're definitely not all the same yeah yeah i agree with that completely the fat bikes or the snow bikes we're talking about a whole different breed of bike that has really wide tires that make them really good for going over soft stuff like snow or sand and it's allowed people now to do mountain biking in the wintertime. And it, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful sport that's really become more popular just recent in recent years. Matter of fact, there's even a bike out there now that has front-wheel drive as well as rear wheel. So you have both tires pulling for you in the snow. And uh, those are just getting started, but it would be fascinating to see how well they do. Yeah. So it's fun because it's no longer just a summer sport. Exactly. Fat biking is really taken off in the Crestview area. We have, we've developed a lot of groomed trails, um, just for fat bikers. And, um, and then we have the fat biking world here. Neither Frank or I do a lot of fat biking, really. We'd rather spend our winter time skiing, but we think that it's great that people do it and that this Valley has embraced it. And people are also using the fat bikes for expedition biking, um, doing, cross-country rides that that might not even be where there's a trail available and because of the wider tires they don't tear up the ground they stay on top of the mud and the sand better and so people have started bike packing with those and covering hundreds and hundreds or thousands of miles of wilderness not not designated wilderness obviously because that's against the law but places like in alaska and things like that the fat bike has made that possible yeah yeah and then to to even get crazier now there's those plus bikes too which are you know the tire sizes that aren't really a fat bike size and they're not really a normal bike size so yeah as they're you said, there's 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 everything these days and of course we're not going to talk about e-bikes but we can talk about those too and then you, you can really get a lot of hate mail i'm sure but anyway <laughs> <laughs> 
get outside with the Colorado Mountain Club. The CMC offers 3,000 outdoor skills courses, excursions, and special events every year to adventurers of all ages and abilities. Join today and receive an additional three free bonus months at www.cmc.org slash adventuresports and use discount code podcast. Hey, have you stopped by Patreon or our ASP member deals site? You can help keep the Adventure Sports Podcast going strong by becoming a sponsor or a patron. Just go to patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast or members.adventuresportspodcast.com to become a member. Don't forget to join our Facebook group so you can be in touch with us and the rest of the listeners. Thanks for listening, guys. When you say e-bike, now that you've mentioned it, um, we're talking about electric bikes that give you a little extra push when you're trying to go up. Yeah, exactly. And I, I personally don't have a problem with them. I, I know I've seen some people that are, you know, they're in their 60s and they're like, oh, if I turn that thing all the way up, it's like I'm 35 again. And that's awesome to, you know, be able to keep doing what you're doing as you get older, for sure. And 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 I don't I don't have a problem with it. If you're younger, you just want the extra push. I I, I don't care. But um, anyway, they're they're um they're growing as you know battery technology continues to improve and everything they're um you know they get lighter and more powerful and um i think for the most part they're allowed everywhere that um that dirt bikes are allowed which makes sense i mean if you can have a have a gas engine why wouldn't you be able to have a an electric bicycle oh yeah i support any mode of travel that gets people out having fun in nature i think it's wonderful and you know the the e-bikes I don't know. I don't want one because I want to work my muscles. I love the the burn, you know, and the and the fitness that I get out of it. But for people that need that little extra something so that they can get out there and do more, man, I'm all for it. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, once again, if people want to learn more about all the different trails that are in this area, then they can go to your site. Once again, what is the URL for that? 14erskiers.com, 1-4-E-R-S-K-I-E-R-S. If you are interested in doing the Trail Quest Challenge, then how do people do that? That app is, uh, I think you get to it from Mountain Bike Home. So it's mtbhome.com. They'll have a link to, you know, how to get that app. And I think it's on either, um, on, a, on the App Store, whether it's it's uh, Android or iPhone, it's um I believe it's GCB Trails is what you would search in, 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 in the app stores. So it's either CBG or GCB Trails, which Gunnison Crest of Butte, Crest of Butte, Gunnison. It's something like that. Yeah, I think, and, yeah, I think they did change it to CBG. I think you're right. Well, it's a ton of fun. And what I love, like I said, about a challenge like that is that it encourages you to uh, get out more often and to go to new places. And I know that you can also record your, your training routes and things on like uh, the Mountain Bike Project app. It's a, it's a similar thing. It's just not specific to this competition. But for people who don't know about that, Mountain Bike Project is a great resource too. Yep, exactly. It's a great resource. I, I did a lot of research on that, trying to explore some of the easier trails um, that I put in some of the Mountain Bike 101 articles that I've published. I'd be interested in your perspective. Do you think mountain biking is a dangerous sport? It's as dangerous as you want it to be. Yeah, it can be dangerous, but it, there's a lot of times when it doesn't have to be dangerous. So it depends on the type of trail and the and the how fast you go and the types of risks that you wish to take. I think there's an awful lot to riding within your abilities, within your limits, just like skiing within your limits. I mean, if you put a beginner on a double black, and <laughs> it's going to be a messy sight, right? Exactly. They They may not do so well, but... It's the same thing with the mountain biking. As I ride more and more, my skill develops more, and then I am game to try more difficult trails. And there just seems like there's no end to the challenge. It's not like, okay, I'm, I'm good now. There's not going to be a challenge. I think that it doesn't matter how long you ride. You can always find something that is going to be challenging and new. Absolutely. So, Frank, I'm kind of curious what your perspective is on that, too. I find it interesting that with mountain biking... Most of the time when I see someone crash, 
they might get a scrape on an arm, but they don't get hurt. And I think that's because with mountain biking, we're not going quite as fast as we might be with some other some other sports. But what's your perspective on that? Yeah, that's true. Um, if you know how fast you go when you're skiing, it's it's definitely a lot faster probably if you're a good skier than, right. than you are on a bike. Um, so as you pointed out, but that said, I think my worst bike injury ever, I was actually going uphill at about three miles an hour and, and endo, this is 15 plus years ago. And I knocked out my front teeth on a, on a rock. Going three miles. Oh, no. So, um, sometimes it can be bad even at slow speed, but you're right. A lot of the time you're, you're going slow and you can kind of, you know, just tuck and roll and you know, get, get some scrapes and that's that. You guys have done a lot of biking over the years, but let's just think about this summer because of the challenge. You've just done so much mountain biking. What was it like to have a mountain bike focused summer? <laughs> well, I mean, I think we're very goal oriented people. And um, this to us was just another goal, another challenge. Um, and, you know, it just drove us to do more and explore more. And, to, you know, spending our entire weekend days going to new places that we haven't been and riding our bikes all day long. Like we just knew that that was what we were going to do if the weather was good and we were going to spend all day doing it. But, you know, that's that's kind of just what we do. We do that with skiing. We do that with biking, with, with whatever we're into at the time. So that's not really any different. It just happened to be mountain biking this year. So did you get burned out on it at all, Frank? No, I was just going to say, I mean, honestly, the summer is pretty similar to every summer. We don't usually ride the same trail more than, more than a couple of times. It's just how we, it's just how we do it. I don't know. Um, this is what we enjoy. And it, part of it is we have so many trails here that we can do that. This year was a little bit more, you know, regimented because of the trail quest challenge. But um, we're always looking, staring at maps and wondering if some other trail will work well. Or, or you know, for me, it might be going on something that I haven't been to in, in 15 years. We've always had kind of a, a list at the beginning of the summer in our head. Of, oh, let's go check this out and that out. And so in that way, it's been kind of similar. But, uh, you know, this... The trail quest thing was interesting because they did some things that we don't usually do. We rode um, Hartman's a lot, actually, in the middle of summer. Usually it's more of a, a fall or spring thing for us. And I realized it's actually really good in the middle of summer. <laughs> you know, we were, we had, you know, we have a stretch where we get a lot of black flies and mosquitoes sometimes here, especially after such a wet winter. And, and we were riding down there and, oh, there's no black flies. This is actually really nice. Who knew? So, yeah, and, and it, we had such a rainy July which is what caused us to ride down there in what most people would think the heat of summer. So it, it's, it, it's, right. it's good, but it's, uh, and, it, and, and like Brittany said, I've had other, we've had other goals. I mean, there was one summer where I was doing a 24 hour bike race solo. And so I kept riding my bike at night all the time and don't really do that as often anymore. And, you know, it, it can really help to get those miles in. If you have, have goals, goals are always a good thing. If you can, if you can find them. Neither one of us got burnt out. You know, we're just, we're actually a little bummed that it snowed so much last night. I think we still have more biking in mind, but we'll take what we can get. <laughs> so, Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thanks so much for coming on the Adventure Sports Podcast and sharing with us. I want people to think of this kind of as an example of how you can use goals to, to motivate yourself to get out and do more of this stuff. And the rewards are pretty fantastic, you know, with, with health and Brittany, even your recovery from knee surgery and with all the life experiences that you get from it, being in the, in the great outdoors and connecting with nature and having fun, just so healthy. And so I wanted to make sure that we got to have the two of you on since you're leading the trail quest challenge. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to hearing how it turns out. Sounds good, and I hope you uh, hit 100 miles so you'll be entered to win the mountain bike as well. I think you have like a month, so you better better get after it. Well, if I just ride new trails instead of the same trails, it, it shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to work on that. I believe Hartman Rocks has about 40 miles of trails, so I think you have some more miles of trails to get done on that. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. There's some there that I could pick up pretty easily, so... All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. 
And until next time, all of you listeners out there, make sure you do get out there and have some fun. And I encourage you to think about mountain biking. If you don't have your adventure sport yet, you don't have to have mountains to have wonderful mountain biking trails in your area. You might be surprised. Go to Mountain Bike Project and look it up. But mountain biking is just such a a refreshing and healthy approach to living and to having fun. So until the next show, get out there and have some fun. Coming up on Thursday's episode, Kurt talks with Andrea Moore with the Wayfaring Band. They create road trips and travel opportunities for adults living with cognitive and developmental disabilities. Until then, get out and have some fun.